Today our guest is Kelly McGonigal. She is an expert in, in body-mind relationship and uh, psychology of yoga. So she's teaching uh, yoga uh, and psychology meditation at Stanford. And today she's here with us to talk about uh, how to use yoga for pain relief. Yeah. So well, let's welcome Kelly. Thanks, Maya. Thanks, Cliff. So as Maya mentioned, I'm a health psychologist and a yoga teacher, uh, and I work a lot with people who have chronic pain issues, but not a lot of people know about my own experience with chronic pain. And one of the most interesting things that has come about uh, from writing this book is that I do have chronic pain and that I've had a headache just about every day of my life for the last 20 years. And the people in my life seem very kind of perplexed by this. Um, they say things like, but, but you doesn't seem to be impacting your life. You seem so happy. Um, and, pain, and it doesn't seem to limit my life. And this idea that you might be able to have pain without suffering um, seems to battle some of my friends and students and come up to me and test me in class. Like, are you in pain right now? <laughs> and if I say yes, yeah, like, you have a headache right now? Wow. Um, because, of course, we have this idea that pain comes with, with suffering. And in my experience, um, through yoga and meditation, uh, it's possible to have pain not completely go away, but to feel like you have your life back again. And sometimes the pain does go away, even if you never knew what was causing the pain, and nothing else seemed to work. And this is kind of part of the mystery of chronic pain. Um, that sometimes it doesn't go away and life gets better anyway, and sometimes it does go away uh, through things that you never thought might be the, the solution to healing your pain. Um, and so I'm here today to talk to you about how yoga can be this kind of miracle worker, creating unexpected healing when nothing else seems to work for pain. Um, because most people who come to yoga for pain relief have tried everything else. They've tried surgeries, shots, medications, acupuncture, massage, maybe a $600 office chair, you name it. Because uh, when we think about heavy hitting medical interventions, we don't tend to think of yoga as being sort of the first place to go. Uh, you know, you, yoga, all that stretching, oming, lying around and breathing. Maybe that'll take the edge off the pain if you chase it with a Percocet, but it really, like, how is that gonna help? Um, and, uh, you know, sort of joking aside, there's a growing body of scientific evidence that yoga can provide profound relief uh, for many different types of chronic pain, whether it's chronic back pain, joint pain, autoimmune disorders, fibromyalgia, chronic fatigue syndrome, headaches, IBS, you name it. If it's a chronic pain, there's probably a study showing that yoga helps and that yoga helps better than traditional medical care. Um, and you may not have one of these particular chronic pain conditions, but we all have chronic stress, and we all have this sort of chronic ordinary suffering of being a human being in a world that's sometimes difficult, and in a body that sometimes does not seem to cooperate. And yoga helps with all of that too. So I hope that you'll hear something today that is useful whether or not you have chronic pain. Uh, so what I wanna do today is talk a little bit about yoga. Uh, give you some, some of the latest insights from mind-body science that's changed the way medicine thinks about chronic pain and gives us a sense of why yoga might be so helpful for chronic pain, as well as some of the, the coolest findings uh, on yoga therapy for pain. And then we'll take some questions and do a little practice. So for those of you who would like to stay, uh, we'll do a practice that incorporates some of the most gentle yoga meditation techniques. You don't need yoga clothes. You don't need a yoga mat, which is good because it doesn't look like anyone brought one. So um, if you'd like to stay for that, you already have everything that you need. So one thing I want to just start off with is that when I say yoga, I'm not talking about sort of you know, power yoga or just the movement component. I'm talking about five different sets of practices from the yoga tradition. There is the movement, the exercise component, but there's also breathing and meditation and relaxation. Uh, and what I call befriending the body or the practices of self-care, kind of um, making friends and making peace with your body, even if you have illness or injury. And definitely not talking about circus yoga. So you don't need to be able to stand on your head or put your leg behind your head or anything else that would qualify you to be on a yoga magazine cover. This is really basic stuff. And there's always a place to start. If you can breathe, you can do yoga. 
If you have a body, you can do yoga. And uh, one of the things that I tried to do in the book was provide a true starting place, even for people who've never done yoga before, and even for people who have some pretty serious physical limitations. OK, so um, I think I'll start by sharing these three key ideas that come out of mind-body science that's really changed the way people think about chronic pain. It may change the way that you think about your own pain and your own stress. And the first is the, the recognition that pain is a uh, protective and instinctive mind-body response. From Mother Nature's perspective, it's not a problem. Pain is not a problem. It's actually a solution, a clever solution of evolution to make you care about whether or not uh, your body is harmed. It's, it's a nice little trick to make sure that you stay alive and that you're motivated to keep yourself away from physical danger. And it starts, the, the full mind-body response starts anytime there is a threat to your body. It could be someone punching you in the face, or it could be pulling a muscle from an activity, or touching a hot stove. And you've got receptors in your skin, your muscles, your joints, and your organs that live for this moment, that have been waiting for some kind of threat so that they can do their job, send a message up to the brain. And that's just the beginning of the pain process. So once your pain receptors have identified that not everything is OK in the world, that there is this threat to your body, to your safety, um, that message gets sent to the brain, and not just the areas of the brain that many of us think of as being important for pain. So yes, that message is going to be sent to the sensory areas of the brain so that you have a physical sense that you are a little bit in trouble. But it also gets sent to the emotional areas of the brain that are going to make you not happy about the fact that you are in pain. And this is why you know, when, we, when we experience physical pain, we start to feel anxious, we start to feel angry, and feel a lot of distress. And that signal also gets sent to the areas of the brain that control your attention and that monitor for conflict and whether or not you've met your goals yet. And so when this signal gets to these areas of the brain, it becomes very hard to focus on anything else except for the pain and the emotions around the pain. So now your mind is going to be highly focused on solving this problem of whatever is threatening your safety. Um, and when the mind is focused in this way, it prompts the body into a physiological stress response so that you have the energy to handle whatever the threat is. So we've got a brain that's completely consumed now with the process of pain, your attention, your emotions, and your sensation. And the body is going to shift into a state of stress to help you deal with it, to solve the problem. And you can imagine how, from an evolutionary perspective, this is really useful because it will allow you to protect yourself. Um, but you know, if this is repetitive, if this is chronic, this is really not a, a great way to live. Uh, and the last part of the, the protective pain mind-body response is something that most of us don't even realize is part of this biological pain response. And that's the process of learning from injury or from pain. You may have noticed the last time you experienced a lot of pain, uh, you're, it was kind of sticky in your mind. You kept thinking about it, or maybe you wanted to tell the story to somebody else. Uh, and that's a really common response to pain. The mind, the brain, is trying to grapple with what happened so that it can learn from it and avoid that pain in the future. But it means that, that we get very stuck on our painful experiences, and we may become even more vigilant for any evidence of threat or pain in the body. Um, and at the level of the nervous system, your body and your brain are also trying to adapt in a way that's going to make it easier to respond to the same danger or threat in the future. So for example, if you've had a back injury, the, the nerves of the spine and of the back are going to actually get better at listening to signs of pressure or inflammation or damage to the connective tissue or to the muscles. Literally, those pain receptors are going to get better at listening for it, and they're going to be more eager to send a signal of pain to your brain so that you will be able to respond more quickly. And this way, we have a, a, a back now that is sensitized to pain. And this learning process happens pretty much with any injury or with any illness, where the, the body uh, is prepared to experience that pain again. And you can kind of think of this as being like backwards from the immune system. If you get a cold, you're less likely to get that same cold again. Or if you have a flu type, you're less likely to get that again. But with pain, once you've had a certain type of pain, you're actually more likely to experience it again because of the way that the body and the brain adapts to a pain experience. Um, and then this level of learning from our pain shows up in one last way, which is that we may try to, to avoid things that could recreate this pain. And for people who've had very painful experience, like an accident or an injury or a serious illness, they may start to limit their lives so that they're not exposed to as many dangerous things. 
Uh, and this can have a self-perpetuating cycle where the more we fear pain, the less we're willing to do, and our lives get smaller and smaller. And that was my experience for a while also. Okay, so this first big idea is that, thanks to evolution, we have an instinctive and protective mind-body response that helps us deal with real threat. And even though it's, uh, it can be annoying, it's useful. But the second key idea to come out of research in the last decade is that chronic pain doesn't work like acute pain. It is not useful in the way that an acute pain process is. Chronic pain is overprotective and learned, not protective and instinctive. People who have chronic pain have a body and a brain that have learned to be oversensitive to a particular type of pain or part of the pain process because it has learned so well from whatever the initial injury or illness or accident or traumatic event was. And there's a lot of different ways that uh, people with chronic pain may have learned this sort of over-responsiveness. I mentioned one, which is the sensitization of nerves. That is, once you have an injury and illness, many times part of the healing process is making the nervous system more likely to think that you are in pain. And for some people, it goes as far as uh, having ordinary safe sensations being strongly interpreted by the nervous system and by the brain as being dangerous, unsafe, and painful. And a, a classic example of that is someone who has back pain uh, or maybe an old shoulder injury or knee injury where they start to exercise again. And the body interprets the very normal, safe, even healing movements of a gentle exercise practice as being painful and damaging. And that's a real experience. The pain is not you know, somehow in your mind, it's real. Um, and it is physiological, but it's no longer realistic. It has nothing to do with actual harm that's being created in your body. And this is a really key insight if you have chronic pain. That it's almost as if the, the body and the brain are lying to you about what is safe uh, and the state of your body and the state of your health. Um, and when the body has learned to, to be oversensitive in this way, sort of overlearned from the experience of pain, it's really important to unlearn this process, and that's where yoga meditation comes in. Uh, it's a process of re-education. The last key idea uh, that's come from the pain research, uh, which, which is the one that people tend to resist the most, because it sounds, it sounds um, well, it sounds ki both kind of discouraging, and also almost a, uh, people have heard for so long that your pain is all in your mind, or your pain is just psychological. Um, that we can be a little resistant to hearing that when you have chronic pain, emotional pain is not distinct from physical pain. And this is not true for all types of pain, but for most people with chronic pain, the brain and the nervous system have stopped distinguishing between stress, anxiety, depression, grief, anger, and something going wrong in the body that we need to be concerned with. Uh, one of my favorite examples comes from research showing that people have chronic back pain. When they get angry, their back muscles uh, tense up, and there's inflammation in the tissues of the back. And that only happens for people who have chronic back pain. It's like the nervous system has associated so many times anger and stress with that biological process that it's no longer that part of the body triggering a stress response, but the stress response or the emotion actually triggers that reaction in the body. Kind of in the same way that if you were to um, remember a, don't do this now, but if you were to remember a great sexual moment in your life, you could trigger some very real changes in your body. Yes, it's possible. Uh, it turns out that chronic pain works a lot like that too. Um, and there's been some interesting research at Stanford showing that even just the memory of pain can recreate changes in the body that, would, um, that are consistent with that pain, like muscle tension, like inflammation, like an increased stress response. Um, and in addition, one of the things I didn't mention is that the protective pain response that I described, the one that is useful for us in most situations, it's the same for a physical threat as for a social threat. That is, the same areas of the brain are recruited, including physical sensations of pain, um, if you have been punched in the jaw or if you've been rejected by a loved one, when you're feeling lonely, you've got the, pretty much the same process going on, same regions of the brain uh, activated as when you have the flu. And that's one of the reasons why heartbreak really, really hurts. Um, or being rejected, or when you're feeling angry at someone, it actually hurts. And you can imagine from an evolutionary perspective, 
why that might be useful too. Because when we think about what threatens our well-being, being separated from the tribe is one of the most dangerous, dangerous things that could happen for your well-being and for your life. And so it seems like evolution has kind of mapped these two together so that when you are in emotional pain or particularly social pain, um, you're going to use the same systems that help protect you when there's a physical threat. And again, this gets very tricky with chronic pain um, because it means that, that the emotions related to social relationships, stress at work, all of that it can reinforce the pain. And in fact, uh, for people who have chronic pain, there's evidence that psychological stress even further sensitizes the nervous system to send those threat signals up to the brain. So when you're stressed or when you're angry or when you're lonely, it's like the whole nervous system is listening for more evidence that something is wrong. Uh, and what all of this means is that if you have chronic pain, stress management is number one on the agenda for healing pain. And even though it sounds kind of woo-woo or fuzzy, uh, handling stress and emotions tends to be a lot more effective for chronic pain than trying to find one thing in the body that's wrong and fixing it with surgery or medications. Because with chronic pain, that one thing that's wrong in the body, that was resolved or healed probably a long time ago. And what you're left with is this kind of residual learning that is systemic. It's in the whole body, including the embodied mind, the nervous system, the brain. It's, not, it's no longer just in your back muscle or just in your knee or just in your jaw or wherever the pain originated. Um, so I think that um, it might be fun to share with you some of, the, some of the findings. Some of you know that I'm a yoga researcher. Um, and I think it's really exciting how much research is being done on yoga these days. I'm going to share with you some of the findings that might either give you a little more motivation to do yoga or that for those of you who are already yoga enthusiasts, you might be able to marshal some of this evidence against the people who are resisting yoga who might benefit from it. Um, I've heard that you shouldn't drag people to yoga, but I think sometimes data can drag people to yoga, which is, which is useful. So there have been a number of studies in the last couple of years showing that uh, yoga is more effective for chronic back pain than regular exercise or, um, or standard medical care, and that a very gentle yoga practice done a couple times a week for about 30 minutes a day, some very gentle moving, breathing, and relaxation, um, actually helps people reduce their need for pain medications, including very strong pain medications like opiates. Um, as well as improving the symptoms, the psychological symptoms of chronic pain, like depression, as well as the, the physical function and the physical pain. And other studies have shown that yoga can really change the way that the nervous system responds to stress. There's a study that just came out looking at restorative yoga, and this is a really easy way into yoga. Restorative yoga, you basically lie around in a bunch of different positions, hugging pillows and breathing. <laughs> um, and this study showed that people who practice restorative yoga um, have lower baseline levels of inflammation. And this is really key because inflammation, circulating levels of inflammation in your body, prime you to experience pain. They sensitize the nerves so you're more likely to experience pain um, and discomfort and swelling and all of that. Uh, and not only do they have lower baseline levels of inflammation, but when the researchers exposed them to a stressful situation, they had less of an inflammatory response to that stress. So things were good from the get-go, and when you stress them out, that stress response doesn't look so unhealthy. It certainly doesn't look like the kind of stress response that, um, that really reinforces and makes pain worse. Um, another key study that came out recently was looking at uh, people who have an autoimmune disorder, which tends to be characterized by high levels of stress response in the body, sympathetic nervous system activation. And they found that a short yoga program actually reduced baseline levels of sympathetic nervous system activity in a population where that can be one of the key factors in determining whether you have a good day, a bad day, a good week, a bad week, whether you can get out of bed or not. And again, it was a really simple practice, but one that included a little bit of breathing, a little bit of relaxation, a little bit of movement. And then there are all the studies looking at meditation as a kind of uh, a special form of yoga, a special uh, sort of unique way to deal with pain by teaching you how to choose the focus of your attention and also how not to panic when you feel pain or a distressful emotion. And there have been studies looking at uh, what you may think of as kind of meditation masters, people who've been doing it for a long time. 
And in these studies, they exposed the meditators to some pretty serious pain, maybe thermal stimulation, point where this is not, um, it's not subjective whether this hurts, there's some real tissue damage happening, this hurts. Uh, and they looked at what happens in the brain of the meditator when they're being exposed to this objective, painful stimulation. And uh, meditators appear to be able to literally shut down parts of the pain processing, particularly the uh, emotional aspect of pain processing that makes you feel like there's something really, really terrible about what's happening in your body. And I started this talk by mentioning that I have, I have a headache almost every day, and yet uh, I don't really have any suffering. It's just kind of there. And I think that's a, a big part of what's going on with some of these meditators, that you can be receiving part of the pain signal, and yet it doesn't launch this full overprotective learned response of the brain freaking out and the body freaking out and having to solve it as a problem. Um, there was even a, a study published a couple months ago that took people who weren't expert meditators, introduced them to mindfulness meditation and a little bit of gentle yoga movement and relaxation. Uh, and before and after this, this intervention, they took pictures, three-dimensional pictures of the brain, and they were uh, particularly interested in the areas of the brain that detect threat and produce the stress response. And they found that after this, this eight-week intervention, um, the participants actually had decrease neuronal density in the regions of the brain that interpret threat and produce a stress response. That is, in a way, like the brain was getting smaller. And this is one of the first studies that's been able to show this, uh, even though there are lots of studies showing that chronic pain and chronic stress makes this area of the brain bigger and more connected to other areas of the brain. And so this is the first study showing that gentle yoga and meditation can reverse that process and essentially create a brain that's more resilient to stress and less likely to produce this overprotective stress response. And um, there's lots of other studies like this, um, including studies that aren't directly connected to yoga and meditation, but show that shifting your focus of attention or improving your mood can have the equivalent effect on pain as a dose of morphine. And this is, this is what yoga practice is all about, choosing the focus of your attention and boosting your mood a little bit. I guess the last finding, uh, that if there's anyone left unconvinced, um, is the, the most recent observation that meditation and gentle movement like yoga increases neuroplasticity. I would mentioned that chronic pain is a learned response. And the, the solution for most people with chronic pain is not something like surgery, but, but the re-education process, the relearning. Um, and meditation and gentle movement increase brain-derived neurotrophic factor, which is what allows the brain to actually learn new habits. Um, and you can, you can actually take a brain that has trained itself to over-interpret stress and pain and become much more resilient and less reactive. Um, and I think, at this point, it might be useful to open it up to some questions about yoga or pain or anything. Now, we're going to, did you want to use one of the other microphones for this, or? This one. Thanks. Hi. Hi. Um, so my question is, you were talking about the body kind of remembering an old injury mm -hmm. um, and being more susceptible or, or, you know, triggering pain more than it would if it didn't have that. Is it site specific? Meaning like if I had one bad knee injury a long time ago, is my entire body more like sensitive to pain or is it just to that right. one spot? It's a great question. Should I repeat it or is that microphone going to pick up? Great. Um, yeah, so it, it depends. Uh, it's definitely not all bad news. Um, probably there, the knee will be more likely to experience pain and discomfort. Um, and it doesn't necessarily translate to the whole body. For some people, it does. Uh, and that happens more at the, the higher level of the nervous system rather than the nerves down at the joint or the, you know, any scar tissue around the joint. And so it, it could be possible for uh, a site-specific injury to translate into um, 
a more general sensitivity to pain, that's not usually how it works. Most of us will have, uh, will have a more specific vulnerability, like back pain or knee pain, uh, or like with myself, with headaches. Uh, but, but there are folks for whom it becomes systemic. Hello. Hi. Hi, Kelly. Question from... Oh. Hey, question, uh, question from Crittenden. Um, I have a friend, or three or four actually, who I think should hear this talk. Uh, do you have any um, public events where you'll be uh, giving a similar talk um, scheduled in the area in the future? Or is there a place where I can uh, learn about those if they should come up? Yes, where is this question coming from? I don't even know where to look. Should I look in the camera? <laughs> uh, you can just look at the camera. I, I can see you. Sorry, that's, that's a little spooky. That's, that's a very kind question. I like those softball questions. Uh, I hear that this talk will be available on YouTube. Um, I, I do have some public events coming up. You can see my website for that. I have some talks at local libraries, uh, JCC Center. Uh, that's at kellymcgonigal.com. And uh, I teach a class at Stanford through continuing studies called the science of meditation, or the science of a calmed mind. Uh, that's all about how these practices, including yoga, change the brain, change the body. And so pe for people who need that kind of academic scientific nudge to adopt this practice, uh, that class is a really good entryway because there are enormous piles of data in that class. Thank you. You're hey. welcome. So I'm, I'm reading this really interesting book. It's uh, by John Sarno called The Mind-Body yeah. Prescription. Mm -hmm. um, you probably read it already. So for those of you who don't know, his whole theory is that your pain is blocking some deep emotional feeling, and it's like a distraction from that feeling. Um, I was wondering what you thought of his thesis. You know, so, so I'm, um, I'm not familiar with his work very personally, but I actually have a student who claims to have been completely cured through one of his lectures. Uh, John Sarno's idea, this idea that uh, most people's chronic pain is uh, a symptom of some sort of repressed emotion, and that just knowing that your pain is not something wrong with your body, but that it's related to emotions and stress. His idea is that just knowing that cures the pain. It's kind of a, a, an education process of just kind of cognitive insight. And once you have that aha moment, the whole pain changes. So you know, anecdotally, I know one person who says that that's true. Um, I, as someone who's very interested in the mechanisms, I like to know a little bit more but, um, in terms of what might be happening in the brain, why an emotion that you either experience or are trying to avoid might, might trigger a pain response. I think, that the, I think the science is not inconsistent with the hypothesis that emotions can trigger chronic pain. Um, but I think that most of the evidence suggests that th there was a, a physical start as well. Um, so it's not going to be completely random. Like you never had a back injury or any issues around the back, but suddenly anger is going to create back pain. I think it's, it's useful to think about um, all of us as having physical vulnerabilities that, um, that chronic stress and emotions will latch onto. But I like his idea that dealing with the emotions is a good place to start. Yes. Oh, oh, sorry. Did we, where is this mic going? Um, you talk about different, um, I guess, modalities. I'm not sure quite what the word is. Um, things that you do to get this um, breathing, Mm -hmm. the movement, the meditation, all this. Um, can you break that down a little bit? I guess, uh, I mean, like if I only had a few minutes to do yeah. one, which one should I do? It depends. It's a great question. What, you know, we can, when I mention five modalities, you got to breathe, you got to meditate, relax, exercise, take care of yourself, that can sound like a three-hour project, which nobody has time for. Um, and so the, the question of what do you do if you only have one minute, I think it's different for different people. Um, and when I, when I work with students one-on-one, -on -one, it, it's kind of an exploration process to figure out what's going to be the one yoga ritual that most makes you feel safe in your body and in your mind. I think that's, that's the sort of the starting question point. Because chronic pain is the experience of the body and brain not feeling safe. And so for some people, it may be relaxation. 
For some people, there may be a specific movement or stretch that makes their body feel really good and cared for. Um, for some people, mindfulness meditation works really well, just sitting down, being with the breath, um, and it could be other things as well. Uh, so in, in the book, I lay out lots of options, and I encourage people to go to what they feel drawn to. And as soon as you hear about it or read, you think, well, that sounds kind of appealing, not painful, not difficult, uh, might, be, might improve something about my state of mind or body. Uh, and when you find something that works, to stick with it. So I mentioned that um, a, a lot of the studies that, that look at yoga for pain relief use all of these modalities. And I'm not suggesting that you have to do all of them in order to feel the relief. But I think in the group setting, in a clinical setting, you need to offer all of them because people will respond to different techniques and different practices. But you yourself may find that it's, it's sitting in meditation for a few minutes or that it's a joint, a joint mobilization sequence. Um, so I can't tell you exactly what to start with, but I would say to start with where you're naturally drawn. Hi. Um, so you talk about this um, secondary pain response where the injured part is not necessarily being damaged anymore, but our brain is kind of tricking us by mm -hmm. sending the pain signal. Mm -hmm. And so my question is, how do you recognize that that's the case, that it's happening? Because it seems like to, to the brain, it seems like the same yeah. kind of pain. It's real. And of course, pain only happens in the brain. I mean, one thing I want to be very clear about is that this pain in the brain is real. There's no other type of pain. And it doesn't matter whether it was generated by someone punching you or something you can observe that's wrong with the body or whether it started in the brain. Um, it's just as real and just as painful. Um, you know, the way that most people start to realize that it's not about something that's objectively wrong in the body anymore is by going through every test under the book and trying surgery and finding that that doesn't work. I mean, it's, it's almost a trial and error because many times when people are in pain, there is a physical problem. It could be cancer. It could be a joint issue that could be repaired. Um, and chronic pain is different in, than most of those situations because chronic pain is persistent and usually unexplainable. Um, and it's only, you know, the, the mechanisms that I'm describing by which pain becomes chronic, it's not like doctors have good ways of diagnosing that. A lot of that comes from animal research um, where, where, you know, where they can really look at what's going on in the nervous system. Um, and so there's, there's not a great way for your doctor to look at you and say, hey, that, that pain's starting in your brain. Although there are some researchers who are using um, real-time brain imaging to help show patients how their pain uh, is being created in the brain. Um, but that's not yet a clinical technique, so that wouldn't be useful for you. Um, but I would say that you know, if you have been exploring through standard physical care the source of your pain and nobody can find anything, and that's what happens for a lot of people, uh, that's when exploring these other aspects like yoga and meditation may end up holding the key. And, and so when you recognize that that's the case, what do you then do? Because if, you, if, you're, if your um, injured part is not hurting anymore, per yeah. se, yeah. the response probably should be different. Right. And you start by retraining the response. So for example, breathing is a technique that, that changes the physiology of the body and the brain pretty quickly. You can breathe in a way that's going to shut down the stress response, lower inflammation. You can breathe in a way that's going to calm down the emotional centers of the brain. Uh, and, and that's the essential training process of yoga and meditation, is you work with a response and you practice a new response. Um, and you, you don't work with necessarily the area of the body that feels like it's in pain. Most people, when they hear that I wrote a book about yoga for pain relief, they're like, where's the chapter on neck pain? Where are the neck stretches for neck pain? Where are the back stretches for back pain? And that does not work with chronic pain because you can't fix uh, a nervous system problem by just stretching out that, that part of the body. And so I think that, personally, I think that's good news because it means even if you don't know what's causing your pain, you can start with the same basic practices of relaxation, simple breath focus, and mindful movement of whatever part of your body can move without pain. Um, so I don't know if that's of any use. Yes, thank you. Um, you know, yoga is a science and it's got many different branches. So I've been thinking of getting into yoga and meditation for quite some time. And every time I kind of got into looking at what I should be doing, I come up with various forms of yoga, like mm -hmm. 
kundalini and hatha and asana and power yoga and then there are different forms of meditation and you know like kundalini yoga says that if you have back problem you should not be doing this yeah. so you know how do you really get started just as a basic person without getting to know that you know if i meditate because somewhere i read that it takes you years before you can even reach to that one second of meditative state where you do not have 500 thoughts crossing your mind in a second <laughs> so it's it's kind of you know demotivating yeah. as well yes. while you want to do it but then you just get confused by all that information that's out there yeah. Mm -hmm. So how do you just get started without, you know? Yeah. So I can actually give a very specific answer to that, and then I'll give a more general response. Um, I actually almost always send people first to mindfulness-based stress reduction programs. Some of you may have taken that. It's an eight-week course yeah. where you learn how to focus on your breath. You learn a relaxation technique. You learn very gentle yoga movements that are safe for most people. Um, and you learn some of the ideas of yoga philosophy and how they relate to everyday life. Um, and even though it's, it's, uh, it tends to be considered a meditation training because it involves movement and breathing and relaxation and yoga philosophy, it's like the perfect introduction to yoga. And I know they offer MBSR all over the Bay Area. They probably even offer it here. Does Google They're have... It's starting next week and I'm It's starting for that. next yeah, week? Yeah. yeah, I think so. I actually think that's going to be a really great introduction. And they will, I think, quickly disabuse you of the notion that it's going to take millions of years to achieve uh, meditation. Um, you know, with meditation, you don't even need to empty the mind or clear your thoughts. You can just... You can have one moment of breath focus in a 10-minute meditation, and that in itself can be healing. So uh, you, you, you can get benefit much sooner than it takes to become uh, a monk. Um, and the other thing that I'll say is that uh, one of the most encouraging things about the research on yoga for pain is that it's almost, they're almost always looking at people who had no yoga or meditation experience uh, and saw these not just statistically significant but clinically significant improvements in eight weeks. These aren't very long interventions. Um, and so, I, you know, I think that there's hope. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, just uh, adding to this discussion that was happening, um, I am a yoga teacher, and I've had an experience of teaching yoga back in India, practicing yoga there and practicing yoga here. And I have found this very big difference in, uh, you know, in the U.S., the, the, like, the way you always talk about yoga and meditation together. Mm -hmm. In the U.S., there is this whole big thing of looking at yoga as another form of exercise. It's right. like, you know, power yoga. And, and I think some of the injuries are created here because there is so much of emphasis on totally the, uh, the physical part, hmm, looking at it as just uh, like another form of exercise. Mm -hmm. And the, the way to enter yoga is to understand it holistically, body, mind, breath. Mm -hmm. Like the way you said, the meditation part is not to be neglected. The philosophy is not to be neglected. And only then hoga, yoga provides this healing process, the whole it's yeah. innate in it, you know, but uh, I feel it, it's kind of neglected here. Mm -hmm. But uh, it, it's, it's the perspective in India is totally different mm -hmm. from here. Yeah, and, I, and, and that's really the traditional perspective. And thank God most of the studies are actually looking at the traditional yoga rather than, you know, super, super fit yoga butt yoga. Um, and that's not where I would, would send someone initially. Um, it, although physical exercise is really, really important, but sometimes yoga classes that are presenting yoga as a hardcore workout uh, really lose the elements of relaxation and breathing that make it so healing for chronic pain. So exercise is important, but I definitely would not start with, with any form of yoga that was advertising itself primarily as a workout. You would mess a lot and possibly hurt yourself. Can you comment on the connection between yoga and diet? Yoga and diet, yes. Um, well, in the yoga tradition, what you eat is considered uh, both a reflection of your willingness to care for your own body and an expression of your values. Um, so, you know, within the yoga tradition, it's it's common to eat the kind of thing that uh, the kind of diet that Michael Pollan might approve of, mostly, mostly plants and real food and not a whole lot of it, or whatever his what are his rules? This is you know. Mostly eat mostly plants and fruits and vegetables. Don't eat too much. Um, I think that that's the essential yoga diet. And uh, there's some, some good evidence that 
eating uh, a mostly plant-based diet, possibly a vegetarian diet, uh, changes the way that the body responds to stress, improving things like heart rate variability and inflammation that could be really important for, for chronic pain and chronic stress. Um, now, I'm, I'm personally a vegan, so I always feel like I'm proselytizing a little bit when I say that. Uh, so let me just say that, that you can go much more broad than that and not worry about the traditional diet and just think of starting to pay attention to how what you eat influences your energy, how it influences your mood, how it even influences your pain. Because many people will find that they have triggers, food triggers, for being in a bad mood. Not what you eat when you are in a bad mood, but food that actually puts you in a worse mood, makes you feel worse about yourself, or makes your body feel sluggish and tired. And so, yeah, you know, without any sort of moral judgments about what you might eat, there's this basic practice of starting to pay attention to how food um, influences you and, and a willingness to take care of yourself by eating what makes you feel healthier and stronger. How about yoga and other form of exercises? You know, do we, if, for instance, if I practice yoga, is there other form of exercise that are more compatible or they are not compatible? Any concern about that? Yeah, so, so the question is, is, are there other forms of um, exercise that are more or less compatible with yoga? And I think uh, the, way that I, the way that I would express it is that once you learn how to move skillfully uh, and honor your body in yoga, it's going to improve your experience in any other form of exercise, whether it's weightlifting or swimming or dancing. And so I would say more that... Um, Learning, learning how to listen to your body through yoga, to not push yourself beyond what seems like a reasonable limit, um, to listen to the signals of your body about fatigue and stretch and pain, uh, and a kind of willingness to stay in the process mentally. All of that is going to make other forms of exercise not just more fun, but a lot safer. So you know, if you learn how to do those things in yoga, you're going to be much less likely to hurt yourself if you go to an aerobics class or play a sport. Um, and I have a, a number of students who are athletes who kind of use their yoga practice in that way as a kind of baseline so that when they go out and do other things, they're less likely to hurt themselves. Uh, in terms of the physical benefits, yoga is not cardiovascular. So if you're thinking about your health, the only way to get a really strong cardiovascular workout from yoga is to do it wrong, to, you know, to not breathe in a slow and sustained way. Because even if you're doing things that are a little bit physically difficult, if you're breathing in the yogic way, you're, you're not going to be, uh, you're not going to get your heart rate that high. There's plenty of studies showing that. Um, so it's nice to, to balance yoga with other forms of exercise that, um, that are appropriate for your body that would take care of that other stuff. All right, well, I think that, um, that wraps up our questions. So thank you very much. Um, it was an outstanding talk. Thank you. Thanks. So I see we have about 15 minutes left. Um, do you want to do a little bit of a practice? Yes? I, I thought that we would do some movement, some breathing, some relaxation and meditation. It's kind of an unusual spot to lie down on the ground and meditate. Um, so let's start with movement, and that may be that movement and breathing. That may be as far as we get. Um, I'm gonna. Yeah. So I'll use this mic, and we're gonna start in a chair. How convenient! But I want you to have a little more space for yourself. So these chairs move. You can move your chair. Maybe come, those of you who are, who are sandwiched in a row, there's a lot of room up front, a lot of chairs up front. You could come up here. This is going to be interesting to demonstrate and hold this at the same time. Oh, that's right. That's what the stand is for. I feel like I'm on American Idol. This. Is that going to be about the right? No. Is that about the right sound volume? Okay, so we're going to be efficient with this and uh, move and breathe at the same time. You were probably already breathing, but you might not have noticed. So we're going to breathe with some intention here. 
And uh, some of the, the key ideas about yoga movement and breathing is, first of all, uh, it should feel better, not worse, than if you were not doing it. Uh, so as soon as something feels obviously worse than before you started, come out of it. There may be a way to come back into it with a little bit less strain, uh, you know, sort of relax a little bit in it, or maybe that this is not the movement or stretch for you in this moment and be willing to honor that. Uh, the other key principle is that um, we join the movement and the breath. So if, you, if we're doing a movement with the breath, let the breath guide the movement, rather than, for example, if we were, we're going to take a movement where we move the spine with the breath, this would be the movement of the inhale, this would be the movement of the exhale, you wouldn't want to move and then breathe and then move and then remember to breathe. There's really no difference between the movement of the body and the movement of the breath. So just work with those ideas. It shouldn't be worse than if you weren't doing it, and we're going to link the movement of the body and the breath. So let's start perched a little bit forward on the chair. If your way slid back, come forward. Let your feet be flat on the ground. Anyone who wants to take their shoes off, you're welcome to do that. Legs comfortably apart. And take a moment to lift your shoulders up to your ears. Some of you already have them there. And then drop them down. And let's do that with an open mouth exhalation. Inhale, lift your uh, shoulders up to your ears. Exhale, relax them down. One more time, let the shoulder blades drop even a little more. And let them kind of rest in this place with the hands on the thighs or on the knees. And on your inhalation, draw the shoulders back, lift the chest, look up a little bit. And as you exhale, put it in reverse. Draw your belly in, drop your chin a little bit. And continue with your breath. Inhale, lift the chest. Exhale, curve the back. Keep it going at your pace. And notice how the movement actually helps extend the breath a little bit if you're patient. When you round the back and pull the belly in, it helps push the breath out. When you lift the chest and relax the belly, it creates a little more space for the breath if you're patient. Take maybe two more breaths in this way. And then finish with the spine feeling pretty neutral here. Bring one hand to the belly, maybe both hands to the belly. And either close your eyes or just drop your gaze a little bit. And now connect to the sensation of the belly moving when you breathe. If you're patient and your pants aren't too tight, you will probably find that your belly expands when you breathe in. And it draws in when you breathe out. And let's take a few more breaths, resting the mind in the sensation of what expands. Feeling the sensation of expansion as you breathe in, and the sensation of that expansion dissolving as you breathe out. Good, and then open your eyes. So with that, we did movement, breathing, and meditation in just a couple of minutes. That first movement helped release tension in the belly and the back. That helps release tension in the breath. Next movement's going to help release tension in the side of the body to also release tension in the breath. So we're going to take the legs a little wider apart if you've got the space for that. And again, kind of scoot forward on your chair. Let your left hand rest on your left thigh, and you might even slide down to your elbow. Notice how just that movement lengthened the right side of your body. That's already a stretch. Bonus, if you like, inhale, take the right arm up. Notice that's a deeper stretch. Are we in the zone now of it still feels better, or did that make it worse? If it made it worse, you can lower the arm down and relax your head in whatever direction feels best. If it feels better to have that arm reaching, do it with some intention. Reach out through the fingers. Feel the length in the side of your body. And make a conscious choice to position your head and neck in a way that feels sustainable. If you had to be here for a little while, what would be the position of least tension, least likely to leave you feeling worse than when we started? And on your next inhale, come all the way up. And exhale, release the arm down. Take a simple breath in, and on your next exhalation, lean onto the right arm. Notice that subtle stretch, that subtle stretch. 
And on an inhale, you can reach the left arm up. <laughs> and stay here for a few breaths. Again, using the reach of the arm to improve the sensation of opening. And you might even have the idea of breathing into the left side of your rib cage and waist. If you just plant that idea, you may find that if you inhale deeply, you can increase the stretch from the inside out. There's a sensation of expanding underneath the muscles that are stretching. One last breath here. And on an inhale, come all the way up. Exhale, release that arm down. You can walk your legs together. And now let's bring our hands to the side of the body, the ribs in whatever way is most comfortable to find that part of your body. And again, close your eyes or drop your gaze so it's easier for the mind to drop into the breath. And now have the idea that if you're patient, the breath might expand the body where your hands are resting. Invite the possibility of some side-to-side -side expansion when you breathe in without trying to force it. And let the mind rest in this feeling, this sensation. As you do so, relaxing the forehead, relaxing your eyes, relaxing the jaw if there's any clenching. And then open the eyes, relax your arms down. And then the next, the next uh, movement or stretch is going to help release tension in the neck and the shoulder. And you even have muscles in your neck and in your shoulder uh, that are involved in breathing. When they're tense, they can turn your breath into a kind of up and down shallow breath. And by relaxing them, uh, it can allow the, the natural movement of the breath in a way that's not quite so stressful and inefficient. So for this, very simple. Drop your left ear to your left shoulder. And notice if you are pulling your ear to your shoulder with your neck muscles, that's too much. We don't need that much tension. Just drop the head and let gravity hold you in this posture. Gravity can help you on the right side, the right arm, by dropping the arm heavy alongside your outer leg, or even hooking on and holding on to the chair if there's someplace easy to do that. And let the weight of the arm bone be heavy, and the weight of your head heavy. And take another couple of breaths, resting in the sensation along the side of your neck, the front of the shoulder and chest. Smiling sometimes improves the sensation of the stretch because the muscles here connect to the side of your face. And on an inhale, come all the way up. Before we do the other side, simply place your left hand on the right side of your chest, underneath the collarbone, right underneath where you were stretching. And have the idea that there might be some expansion of the breath under the hand here. This is more likely to be a subtle expansion of the breath. And it doesn't involve lifting your shoulders up to your ears. But if you close your eyes and drop your gaze, see if there's a kind of massage that's happening in this area of the easy, subtle expansion of the lungs as you breathe in, and the release of that expansion as you breathe out. As if the lungs and the heart gently expanding, gently swelling with the breath. Then open your eyes, relax your arms, and let's, let's even that off. Take the second side, dropping your right ear to your right shoulder. And again, there's a real difference between trying to pull the ear and shoulder together with your neck muscles and shoulder muscles versus once you've tilted, let it go. Let gravity drop the weight of the head. And your left arm can hang down by your side or hook into the chair if that feels more supportive. And you can even experiment here with how much the chin is tucked down versus lifted up. It's a big difference. And you can find the position, the angle of the chin, that feels best to you, to what's needed in this moment. See, there's a way to enjoy the sensation. We sometimes interpret stretch as pain, but this is probably a safe movement for you and maybe even a healing movement. So see if there's a way to interpret it in that way and enjoy how it feels. And on an inhalation, bring the head back up to center. 
And then take your, your right hand, rest it on the left side of the chest, and close your eyes or drop your gaze. And invite the possibility that this part of the body will also have a nice rhythmic expansion and release as you breathe. This is one of my favorite meditations, hands-on breathing. Gives the mind something to focus on, helps relax the body. Go ahead and open your eyes if they're closed. And let's take one last stretch. This will be um, for the, the front of the chest. You can bring your hands to the back of your chair. And uh, you know, depending on your shoulders and how tight your jacket is, uh, reaching on top of the chair might feel better or reaching along the side of the chair might feel better and see which is true for you. And then just kind of hang the rib cage forward and the head can rest in a neutral position. And you're not looking for the world's biggest stretch here. This is a shape change. The spine is moving into the body. The chest is being open as the arms are pulled back. And whether you're feeling a lot or whether you're feeling a very subtle stretch, you can kind of trust this process. Let's see if you can feel the expansion of the breath in your rib cage and chest. And then relax back to center and rest your hands over your heart, underneath the collarbones. And again, you can drop your gaze or close your eyes and invite the possibility that this area of the body will also expand gently when you breathe in and sink as you breathe out. And each time this area sinks, each time the heart sinks, imagine any last bit of stress or tension exiting the body. And then go ahead and uh, open your eyes. Okay, so that was a little meditation, breathing movement all at once, something you can do uh, at your office without people giving you funny looks like when I used to try doing strange yoga poses in my office. Unless you have a private office and then anything goes. Uh, do they have private offices here? See, I don't know anything about Google. Well, thank you very much for coming. I think we are definitely out of time. Uh, if anyone, a couple of people had asked me to sign books, I'm more than happy to, to write a dedication to you, if you'd like. And if you have any other one-on-one -on -one questions you didn't want to ask for all of YouTube, I'm here for that too. We will turn off the camera and the mics.